Hi, I'm Lance. Welcome to Feel the Boot, a channel with tips and advice for early stage founders. Now, this episode is going to be a little bit different because I'm going to be talking about a project in development. I've been working with a number of founders who are looking at finding the right direction for their business, either because they're just getting started and they're not quite sure where they want to go yet, or because they realize they need to pivot, but it's not quite obvious which direction they should pivot to. So I've been developing a tool to help them optimize that decision-making process. And that's what I want to share with you today. Hi, this is Lance from the future. While I was editing this episode, I realized it was running a little bit long. So I've decided to split it into two parts. This is part one, where I'm exploring how to use this tool for picking a direction for your business. Part two will be exploring in more depth the top options that come out of this process. Now, it's important to remember this is not an irrevocable decision. You always have the opportunity to pivot again later, but you want to start off with an idea that has the maximum chance of success. So the point of this exercise and using the tool is to find that optimum direction for your business. And the first question is, what is the problem you're trying to solve? What's the thing that people need? The next is, who is that customer? Who wants to do what? The third is, what is the solution that you're proposing? What are you going to do that makes their life better, that resolves that unsolved issue in their lives? How big's the market? Is this hundreds of people or billions of people? And how badly do they need it? How much pain or desire do they have for a solution to this problem or some new capability? And finally, how do you differentiate yourself from their other options, the things they may be doing anyway? Download the Business Direction Worksheet tool from the link down in the description. The nice thing about using this tool is this should not take too much time. You should easily be able to work your way through the basic tool in a day. Now from there, there's more work to do. Basically, using this tool is a navel-gazing exercise. You don't need to go out and do a whole lot of other research. However, once you nail it down to just a couple of best choices, then you do need to do some real homework to make sure that the assumptions and guesses you made actually stand up to scrutiny. One thing I didn't include in this tool is your passion. And that is really critical to any direction you want to take. Once you start a business, you're going to be spending most of your waking hours devoted to this for the next several years. And if that's not something you want to be doing, then you should really pick a different direction. So don't even write anything down that you're not confident you would love to spend your life doing. When interacting with this tool, you want to throw a wide net. You need to come up with as many ideas as you possibly can in a non-judgmental way. Just keep looking for different directions you might go, different kinds of business models, different use cases, different solutions. Write them all down. We're going to filter that out later. Importantly, don't jump to the end. Don't make an assumption about where this process is going to take you at the beginning. The whole point of this is to work through these steps to make sure that you've considered other possibly superior options. Right now, I see three general approaches to filling out this worksheet. First, you may have a very specific idea. You think you know exactly what you do want to do, or potentially you already had a business direction and you need to pivot away from that, but that can be your starting point. Next, you may have some set of skills or knowledge or abilities and want to build a solution around that, and you're exploring what kinds of problems might be, you be able to solve from that starting point. Or maybe you have a really deep understanding of some set of problems. You're an industry expert in some area and you're looking at what are the solutions you can come up with to that set of problems that you're aware of. So if you have that idea to start with, either because you came up with this in a bolt out of the blue or because it's where you're working right now, you want to be looking at variations on the theme. If you have some set of capabilities, maybe you just picked the wrong customer to start with and it's worth thinking about other customers that might have similar problems that might make better markets for your solution. A lot of companies start with technical expertise. You've got a developer, he's interested in some technology and wants to build a solution around that. So maybe you're an expert cryptographer or you know everything about configuring and managing firewalls or dealing with spam, or you've got some deep technical understanding of very complex real estate transactions. Any of those could be the basis of a business. 
So I'm going to run through a hypothetical as we go through this tool. And I'm going to think of an entrepreneur, we're going to call her Liz. And she is an expert in robotics and automation. And so she'd really like to do something involving that. The third approach, of course, is to start with understandings of some unmet need, typically coming out of a deep expertise and knowledge in a particular market. So you've worked there, you've seen the problems people suffer with over and over. Maybe you've personally experienced the deep frustrations and you want to create a business around solving those kinds of problems. But there's a whole nother category of things that are things that people would love to have. They're not necessarily a problem, but they want something to exist. And of course, entertainment is the most obvious example of this. Video games don't necessarily solve a pain point for anyone, but people are willing to shell out substantial dollars for entertainment to really enjoy themselves. So for example, you might really understand massive inefficiencies in medical record systems and have some insight into how that might be better. You might see that there's some new kind of cyber attack that's taking out businesses left and right, which none of the existing security tools are properly addressing. Or you're really frustrated that there's no good virtual fantasy turtle racing simulators that you and your friends want to play together. For our example, Liz is passionate about beauty and home grooming. She thinks that there's a large population of people who are frustrated by what it takes to get the kind of look that they want to achieve. And she feels that maybe she could combine that understanding of the problem with her technological background to come up with a truly innovative solution. So let's walk through the tool from Liz's perspective. And she's gonna start putting down some ideas that she has. First off is haircuts. Haircuts, in particular women's haircuts, are very time consuming, they're expensive, they make you take out time from your day and go to the salon. She thinks that's a real pain point for people. So she's going to target an audience of women who want to get their haircut at home with real style. And the level of pain is moderate, right? It's only about an hour every month or so, maybe say $50 to $100 per visit. But still, a lot of people are frustrated by that. Her market size is going to be professional, middle-class women and up. Probably, let's say there's 50 million people who might be interested in something like this. So not a huge market, but robust. Right now, they have two fundamental options. Either they can go to a professional hairdresser and get their hair styled and cut, colored, permed, whatever it is they're going to have done. Or they can try to do a do-it-yourself do solution, cut your own bangs, use a flow bee to... You know, cut your hair at home. A lot of people are starting to experience this during COVID with hilarious results. Her solution is let's create some kind of a robot with scissors and clipper arms, kind of a mechanical Edward Scissorhands that can come up and quickly cut your hair, style it, do everything at home. Uh, but it's probably going to be expensive. There's a lot of moving parts to this. We're maybe talking uh, $100,000 per unit for the early units once she starts to actually think about it but at least it's fast and it's at home. And the advantage is at home, less time, but it is more expensive than going out to a hairdresser and versus the Flowbee, certainly better results, probably the same level of convenience, uh, but certainly at least 2000 times as expensive. So hmm, we'll see how that lines up with the other ideas that she has. So another thought might be doing makeup in a mirror is tricky. And it takes a lot of actual expertise to get good at doing your own makeup. Women want an easier solution to get high quality makeup job at home uh, without all the experience and skill that's required to get the looks that they may see on YouTube or other venues. The level of pain significant. More perfect makeup applications, the really get the look they want, which they may not be able to achieve at all. That's worth something to a lot of people. Uh, the benefits accrue every single day. Most women are putting on the makeup every day, so that's something that they're going to feel every time they use this product. So a potentially large benefit for these people. Market size, again, probably the same market, professional women, upper middle class, let's say 50 million people. The current solutions, they can do it themselves, like they've been doing for millennia, or they can get a professional makeup artist in. Very expensive, very inconvenient, not a lot of people doing that. She thinks that there might be a solution using a combination of 3D scanners, uh, inkjet printing, and airbrush to automatically apply a look to your face using maybe some machine learning to work out how to optimize the look to exactly what you want to achieve. 
probably not as expensive because airbrushes and inkjet printers are getting cheaper all the time. So these are not terribly complex components and probably most of the machinery, the physical device can be pulled from off the shelf components. Advantages, better results, no skill, and certainly much more convenient and cheaper than professional makeup artists if that's gonna be used frequently. She's gonna move on. Maybe she's gonna think about what men need. Men need to shave every day, but uh, it's inconvenient. They don't like to do it. They nick themselves. And plus, you really only have the choice of beard or no beard, but what if you wanna maintain stubble? And so she thinks about a laser stubble remover that will vaporize all the hairs on your face to the exact length you wanted. And ideally many more. You want a lot more than three ideas, but I think this is enough to explore how you might fill out a tool like this. So next. Sit down and look at the things you put down in that table and see, are there any obvious losers you want to eliminate right off the bat? So perhaps there's a weak need for it. Maybe you say, you know what? This would be a cool thing for men, but most men are lazy and don't care a lot about grooming. So they're unlikely to go way out of their way to use a tool. Plus, you know, laser hair removal might be a bit of a risky activity. Is the market size too small? Right? If you've got some tiny group of specialists who want this and it's not that valuable a product, it's not gonna make sense as a market to go into. Are there a lot of effective existing solutions? If, if this is a crowded field and people are genuinely pretty happy with the solutions they've got, then this may not be a good choice for you to move into. You may want to eliminate it right off the bat. Frankly, all of my silly examples really fall to this one, but for the purposes of this exercise, I'm going to assume that, in fact, people are not happy with their existing solutions and they want to use some ridiculous high tech. And finally, can you do this for a reasonable price? You may have a solution that people want, but at some price that's completely unreasonable. For example, my virtual Edward Scissorhands solution at $500,000 per unit, no way is that a reasonable price for anyone to play. Plus, the odds of being killed by the machine when it goes haywire are pretty substantial. Another question to ask yourself in all seriousness is, are you the right person to solve this problem? Do you have the chops to get it done? Either if you're say a coder, could you code this thing up? Do you understand enough machine learning to build the thing you want? Or do you have the contacts or ability to quickly recruit a team around building this? Because even if it's a good idea, it might turn out that you're not the right person. So having eliminated the obvious losers, look at the list and try to determine which are the best remaining options, which ones are large markets with significant needs that don't have too many competitors. It's great if, for example, it's either an underserved market or a particularly unsexy market where there aren't a lot of other people clamoring to address exactly the same problem that you're addressing and where you have some substantial advantage over the existing solution so people would want to make a change to go in your direction. You want to end up with a couple of different options to start exploring further. But for Liz, there's really only one that looks good. It's the inkjet makeup applier because the price is fairly reasonable. It's using fairly well-established tech. She understands it. It seems to be a fairly significant problem. At least when she walks down the street, she thinks there's a lot of people who could do better if they used a tool like hers. Uh, so she knows how to build it as well. So that's a plus. The one thing that she probably doesn't have is marketing experience, but she's well-connected. She believes she could easily recruit someone to deal with the marketing side of the business. Now you've got your top few options for a direction to take your business. These are the ones you think are most likely to succeed. At this point, you can start digging deeper. And this is when we move from just navel gazing to actually doing some research. But rather than trying to research 20 or 30 options, you're only gonna research, say, three options to see which of these is in fact the most viable. Editor Lance here again. That's it for part one of this episode. In part two, we're gonna take those top options and examine them in more detail to narrow down to the one best direction for your business. Thanks for watching this episode of Feel the Boot. I hope you found it useful and interesting. And if so, please do the usual like, subscribe, ring the bell. If you are getting value from this, please do subscribe. It makes a big difference and share this with other entrepreneurs. I'm trying to help as many people as I can. And the bigger the audience, the more I can justify continuing to create content. Till next time, ciao.